Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Let's get after it. So the Monroe Institute and Holographic Earth, let's get into it. This topic blew up on social media last year, but it was very clear that the creators who were creating content about this topic didn't actually know what they were talking about. Most of them said that it was a CIA experiment in which it was not. The CIA simply studied the hemisync process and then used it as they do for their own benefit. But within the CIA document on their study on the Monroe Institute, which is still an institute that you can still go and graduate from classes there, you can attend in-person or online classes, which is just absolutely insane, or you can find the gateway tapes on YouTube or eBay. But anyway, within the CIA document summarizing the entire experience, they did come out and say that the Earth was nothing but a hologram. This is why it's possible, per the CIA, to astral project and see things from a remote viewing standpoint. Yes, the CIA admitted to being able to remote view places. As far as Earth being a hologram, you can create your own reality. You simply just have to master your own frequencies and your own vibrational awareness. What you put out into the universe is exactly what you will receive back. So if all you're worried about is not being able to pay your bills, all you're going to continue to do is not be able to pay your bills. But if you start aligning yourself with the vibration of abundance, you're going to start to see abundance happen in your life. This is part of why I went from being homeless to being able to afford where I live today. I personally did not make it all the way through the gateway tapes because they started to get a little freaky. And personally, I did not feel safe anymore in the astral realm. As always, I look forward to hearing your thoughts about all of this down below. If you guys want me to deep dive into my own personal experience, I will gladly do so. But it was a lot to handle. I do want to get back into it and do it all over again, but the tapes are like an hour and a half long each. And it's a very in-depth process. So let me know, have you listened to any of the tapes or did you read the document? The full CIA document is linked on my X account if you want to check it out here. Alright, I've never heard of the Gateway Tapes. So that's something that I'm going to be looking up and seeing what the, what that's all about. As far as uh, the idea that we're living in a hologram or a holographic existence, I'd say it's a possibility. We know that technology is advancing to the degree now that we'll be able to create a holographic version of our planet that's indistinguishable from current reality probably within the next five to ten years. Unreal Engine right now is able to produce some stuff that looks better than what I can pick up with a camera. But I don't think that we're living in a holographic simulation or anything like that. I think that this is part of our reality. I think there's more to it than this, but I don't think that this is a hologram. Government admits flat earth document number three from the U.S. Army titled an energy budget model to calculate the low atmosphere profiles of effective sound speed at night. There's an image in the document where it shows a near and localized sun, crepuscular rays, and a flat earth. Page 16, flat earth. Why is there so much data and documentation coming from the CIA and the FBI showing flat earth models if the earth is not flat? My best guess is that these are ideas of models of how things could have worked if the sun was local, if the earth was flat, and that they release this specific stuff because they know that these theories are out there. It's going to help deter people from digging into truths that matter. Not saying that if the earth was flat, it wouldn't matter. It absolutely would. But I think that they release some of this stuff to keep you preoccupied with it so that you don't notice the other stuff that gets released or so that you don't start digging in other areas. Let's talk about the craft. Okay. How big was it? 300 feet is what I'm estimating, about a football field. And the reason why I say this is because we flew on a CH-53 Super Stallions. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Mm -hmm. Your time was sealed. They're roughly 100 feet, all right? So from nose to tail, if you lined up three of them, it'd fit three of them under this craft. Because I can see, you know, especially the operation behind us, you kind of see them off in the distance. So you try to gauge, you know, as a Marine, you're always trying to judge distance, you know what I mean? Because if you're having to engage, but lo and behold, we end up having a surprise right here happen with these guys. But that's how I know it was around 300 feet. Okay. That's a, that's a, and it was circular. Circular. It's like an octagon because it had like corners on it that was like an octagon shape, but still circular. Could you see, was it one smooth piece of metal? No. Was it panels? Panels. Yep. How Which, were they, how, just describe more. Were there windows? So, were there openings? There were not windows. Nothing I could see like that. Um, they just had that Vanta black vent looking things on each corner. That's all I saw with that. And it had like an octagonal scale pattern that went through it. It honestly reminded me kind of like a design for an F-22 Raptor. Okay. You know, I like the top of it. It kind of looks like that. Yeah. That's what it kind of reminded me of with because it would transition those colors. 
So I suspect, you know, I've had people I've talked to about this to say, well, you know, Lockheed Martin has reverse engineer stuff that's circular. Raytheon, they have triangular craft. And he said it might have been Lockheed because Lockheed also made the F-22. Similar design concept. Now that I think about it, right, because at this time you're not really thinking about it, you're like, I got the, I'm more concerned with these guys and who the hell they are. So after we witnessed the last truck going on there, and we're still dealing with that. I got searched already, of course, and I'm just paying attention to what's going on. I'm making sure my guys are good too. And all of a sudden, the trucks, we never saw them again. They, they were not on that platform. There was like boxes and stuff that were on that platform. And uh, so I'm assuming they either drove off on the other side or disappeared where, or where they went, I don't know. But all of a sudden, we noticed that this platform raises off the ground by itself. It doesn't make any noise, by the way. It doesn't disturb anything. Bef just... Before it started gaining elevation, Yeah. How high off the ground was this? The right. actual craft? Yes. I would say probably 20 feet. Okay. Yeah, good distance. And the platform rose up, but I would say like the platform was up uh, several feet, right? Probably maybe five, six feet, because it was, you know, from the distance probably about half an inch. I mean, I'm just envisioning, I'm envisioning a, the way you're describing this, I'm envisioning an, an octagon yep. rotating mm -hmm. clockwise with a drop ramp similar to maybe something you would see on the back of a C-130, C-17, but circular. But circular and separate. There's no cables, there's no... Okay. Yeah. Was the ramp attached to the craft? No. So there was just an opening? There was just an opening. Like the bottom part of the craft, that was what I'm assuming, because that's where I saw it lift up and go into. It was okay. like the bottom part. It was like the, the floor itself was like the platform and they were just rolled up, right? But at the same time, the, the top part leveled a little bit and went down to meet with this. And as that happened, you start to see it rise up past the tree line. And it's not like a super fast and just rapid. It's just like kind of slow. As that's going on, the rotation has not changed. The audible hum has not changed. But It's not like somebody hit the gas and you hear a different Yeah, it's nothing like that. Noise. It's no, just... Just constant. Okay. Each point on that octagonal shape started to illuminate colors. Like, and it was just one color per point. It was red, it was green, it was yellow, and it was blue. It was the only colors I saw, and it was rotating, right? As Soon as it got to the top of the tree line, like cleared the trees, this thing shot off to the left. And to the left was the ocean, by the way. Like I said, it didn't change pitches of noise or anything, and it just completely shot off. I mean, it's just like a blur that went left. Didn't make a sonic boom. Like you see a fighter jet when you see the pressure that, you know, the way that that happens. It didn't disturb any of the trees like what Rotor Wash would do on a Hilo or a, a jet flying the map of the earth and leaving exhaust and blowing the, you know, you kind of mm -hmm. see Top Gun movies without cranks no up propulsion. on that. Nothing. There were even coconuts that you could visibly see on these trees. None of them were disturbed. I like stuff like this because I feel like these are the type of videos that need to be getting attention. This guy is describing this alien type craft that was right in front of him that he fully believes was manufactured by Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or somebody. And I think that's the most likely scenario is that all these crafts are man-made and that the idea of aliens and UFOs and stuff coming from space is so exciting that people just automatically jump to that conclusion. And so because they know that people want to jump to that conclusion, it's easy for the government to fly under the radar and just say, oh, that's just something unidentified. We don't know what it is. Hey, if you're enjoying this video and you like this kind of content, I make a new one just like it every single day. It'd be awesome if you'd hit that subscribe button and come back tomorrow to join me. I've been asked recently, what convinced me of the mud flood? What was the first images I saw that really did it for me? And I've seen a lot of it floating around the web for a few years before I really bought into it. But the Easter Island heads, once they started digging them up and realizing they weren't heads, but whole bodies going many meters underground. Completely different from the Easter Island heads we get in our media and our education. Heck, they even showed Squidward's house as an Easter Island head. But that really showed me. It was a real eye-opener seeing the Easter Island heads like this. And for many of you, it might be a first time seeing them like this yourself. I've also been asked, where did I hear about the mud flood from first? And I'm not really sure. 
I've always been somebody that just enjoyed digging up things that went against the narrative. Going on a lot of photo sites, uh, Pinterest, Tumblr, back in the day, led me to some of the first uh, pictures of the mud flood I've ever came across. But it has evolved a lot in the last few years, certainly from back in that day. It overjoys me now seeing how much I are eager to dig up our true past and their own personal findings that go along with it. Question everything, friends. Until next time. One interesting thing that I noticed as he was going through those pictures where they're actually excavating below the ground level for these statues, I don't think that they were intentionally buried. I think that there was some sort of a flood or something that buried them below the sediment because they've got carvings and stuff all over the back of them, which why would you go through the extra trouble of carving all of these symbols and signs and stuff that are meant to be read or represent something I'm, I'm assuming and then just bury all that stuff where it can't be seen it doesn't make any sense you wouldn't go through that extra effort i feel like this does actually lend some credibility to the mud flood theory because we have a right brain mm -hmm. and we have a left brain mm -hmm. so our left brain is the rational seat of thought so if i look at my left temporal lobe that's where my brain processes numbers and mathematics number theory etc I look at the right temporal lobe, so it's just the exact same anatomy of the brain, but on the opposite side, that's where my brain processes music. So you got math and music. Mm -hmm. Now language is at the center of the brain, right? It's slightly more to the left side. And then you got geometry right around the center as well. Mm. That's why geometry is so powerful, it's like a QR code for the subconscious mind to awaken mm. this electrical canopy around your pituitary gland and your pineal gland. Geometry is the doorway mm. to being able to do that. Now, it's interesting because our right eye connects to the left hemisphere of the brain. Mm. The left eye connects to the right hemisphere of the brain. It creates an X. Mm -hmm. Those optic nerves create an X right at the pituitary gland mm -hmm. called the optic chiasm. Yeah, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's right. 19 keys and it's a high level conversation so if he's saying that we need to study geometry if that's the uh, the key to everything is that saying that we everyone should study this geom geometria or whatever the i don't know what it's called i get comments about it all the time telling me to look into it and i just haven't yet geometria i think is what it's called but I'm, I'm sure that's i'm sure that's wrong the study of breaking everything down into numbers and then looking for context clues within those numbers to see if they have any relevance to what you're trying to study I think that's what that is, but the reason I haven't looked into it is I, I have a very, very slim understanding of what it even is, which you could clearly tell by my, exp my attempt at an explanation of it. If there's anyone who's watching this video who has an understanding of it and, and actually believes that the, there's some importance to it, that it has some, some value, go drop me a line over at the Discord or down in the comments. I'm just more likely to see it if it's in the Discord because you can tag me over there. But please, somebody drop me a line and let me know what is the importance of this Gematria stuff. Parts of the Book of Enoch talks about the fallen angels coming down and then teaching the people weaponry, technology, how to farm, how to do all this stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, they, they slept with women and created Nephilim. And then in the Book of Enoch, it said these were giant men and their appetite can never be sustained or whatever. So yeah they would start eating men. And Oof. so they're just like these evil giant men. But this Native American, not referencing scri uh, scripture at all, talked about in America, these star people came down and they taught the natives how to make bow and arrows and how to cultivate yeah, and so farm and like do all this story. stuff. And he says, and then these star people basically would sleep with the women of the tribe. These women would give birth to giants and these giants had red long hair. He said, but then they would eat the men of our village or just the people. And so we had to drive them out and kill them and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, it's all lining up. What? It's all lining up. Weird. I'm scared. <laughs> I don't like that news. That is That's terrifying. Scary. That's very, very scary. I wish that didn't exist. <laughs> I'm completely convinced that we had giants. There's just too many stories and stuff that have lasted throughout the, the centuries and stuff depicting giants that all have the same details. Red hair, six fingers and six toes, cannibalism. And you can't take a story like that with those specific details and just have it magically appear in another culture on the other side of the planet it just doesn't make any sense it doesn't add up and people weren't there was no internet back then they weren't spreading the news about hey here's what happened over here 
and then someone else carried on the tail in a new area. These all originated from different locations, so I'm convinced. Bro, they're coming for us in our sleep. Let's just talk about dream hacking for a second. Maybe some of you guys saw this video on TikTok. How are you finding all of this out? Years of research. The McDonald's Corporation just had a, uh, an ad come out a few months ago that they're looking into research and development in a technology that will afford them the ability to pump their commercials into your brain while you're sleeping. You think that they figured this out or some other company figured it out first? You think that there weren't agencies that have been wielding this for a decade or so? So it's wild because the military actually has technology that they've been using that's been well documented. One of them is called the active denial system. It makes your target skin feel like it's on fire. You can look up demonstrations on YouTube where they show how they use it. Obviously, this you can't see this beam, but it disperses crowds because immediately everybody's skin feels like it's on fire. But the scary one is this long-range acoustic device, LRADS. They nicknamed it the Voice of God. So this dude is Robert Duncan, and he's a Harvard scientist. Like, his pedigree is incredible. He's Harvard, he's MIT, he worked on projects like DARPA for the CIA, the Justice Department, Department of Defense. And he has been raising alarm bells about this for years. He worked on these projects and nobody's listening. When he talks about technology that is already developed, that he helped work on, right? People are like, mind control, you can't impact me. He's quoted as saying, how do you control a brain? Most people do not believe that. I have my own free will. There is no way you can get to my soul. Well, I'm sorry, that is not true. My Listen to real specialty is artificial intelligence and robotics and redefining what human beings will be in the future. And a lot of people find this scary. I don't want to be redefined. I don't like this idea, something that's beyond my control. The very sense of self uh, is going to be altered. Well, you're actually under a lot of control systems and you have been since birth. And something that I worked on, uh, and I'm not proud of, but uh, it's called the voice of God weapon. So, there are four different techniques and technologies that can pipe voices into an individual's head. And once you can do that, you can control them using neural linguistic programming techniques. You're rewiring their thought processes and brains. And so this gets into what's called offensive information warfare. And they used it, I believe in the Gulf War, uh, to tell the enemy at that time, lay down your guns, this is all of And it worked pretty well because hearing voices which have no direction or sound, you have to assume that it's some spiritual entity. So that video is like 20 minutes long and it's on YouTube. And honestly, I can do additional parts. We can dive deeper if you guys are interested. But I think the scariest thing about this is if we have this technology, do other foreign governments have it? Could it be used on us by our own government? Could it be used on us by other governments, right? Companies freaking advertising in our dreams. Are you kidding me? Like what an invasion of privacy. But I've had a couple of you guys DM me telling me that I need to make a video on this. And it's just, it's insane. Like nobody's talking about this. Congress has been presented multiple bills on how they can regulate this, how it shouldn't be used on civilians. And of course, none of them get passed. They don't care, but yeah, let's ban TikTok. That's the issue. It's just, it's wild guys. Like every day, it's just increasingly more and more obvious that like we are living in Black Mirror. And like, it's, it's terrifying. Like, can we just stop? The voice of God weapon. All I picture is like, I have a voice inside of my head. I'm one of the 24% or whatever that does. So I think, to myself with a voice constantly. They have AI and they have the ability to replicate your voice. So imagine that they shoot this voice into your head that sounds just like you, but it's telling you to do things you don't want to do. You would just think, I'm starting to lose my mind. I'm starting to have these bad thoughts. And eventually, because everyone thinks their thoughts are them, that that's their self talking to them when it's really not. It's just how you're processing things. Eventually you'd succumb to it. That's terrifying. Neuralink's first victim, I, I mean, participant, speaks out. Elon Musk is mostly known as American's hero who brought us free speech in hopes and dreams of one day allowing the blind to see and the lame to walk again through Neuralink, the magical chip in the brain. But does he have something more sinister up his sleeve? 
We all know he's no stranger to lying signs and wonders, but is Neuralink treading dangerous territories into counterfeit miracles? Well, Neuralink's first participant speaks out and says how awesome it is that he can play video games with his mind now, controlling his computer with his mind. But this participant was paraplegic. Don't you remember them selling this to us as the blind could see and the lame could walk? This would heal that. I mean, that was the number one goal of Neuralink. So now it feels like we're being trolled on the number one selling point. Have you seen a movie called The Kingsman Secret Service where this guy encourages the whole world to get this chip? He would send out a frequency through these chips and anyone who had one would go completely bonkers and they would start having aggression and well, You'll have to watch the movie, but with a brain chip that can neurologically transmit signal to technology, don't you think that's a two-way street? When I saw this movie, I was like, you know, something's coming. And to be quite honest, it seems like this thing was oversold and they're trolling us at this point. If there is a technology that can transmit from here to here, it would be naive to say that it can't transmit from here to here. So, please stop allowing false hopes sell you a bad idea the one thing that i think's being uh, overlooked here with this is that these are eventual goals of neuralink is to be able to do that stuff this is the very first implant i'm sure that whenever it gets to the point that we're able to use neuralink to help people walk again or see again it'll be a completely different device it will be much more advanced and you know it'll be neuralink 5.0 or something because they're going to go through different iterations of it this is just the very beginning stage i don't think anyone expected the very first neuralink to cure someone who was a quadriplegic <laughs> well except for maybe that guy <laughs> time will tell if we'll reach that capability with the neuralink what he's worried about and what he's warning everyone about is absolutely true no one needs to be sticking this thing in their head unfortunately there are people out there that need this thing and hopefully those are the ones that get it and nothing bad comes from it, but I don't trust it. That the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. The casting couch even applies to children. Oh yeah, not in the same way. It's all done under the radar. Nobody talks about pedophilia. It's the big secret. And it's widespread? Oh yeah. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old surrounded literally didn't even know it it wasn't until i was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me until i went oh my god they were everywhere like vultures you believe that children are being abused by pedophiles in Absolutely. Hollywood. so why are you sitting down talking to me why aren't you sitting down with the police right now i've told the police in fact, if anybody wants to go back to 1993, when I was interviewed by the Santa Barbara Police Department, I sat there and I gave them the names. They're on record. They have all of this information, but they were scanning Michael Jackson. All they cared about was trying to find something on Michael Jackson. You said, by the way, did not abuse you. Michael was innocent, and that was what the interview was about with the police in 1993. I told them, he is not that guy. And they said, well, maybe you just don't understand your friend. And I said, no, I know the difference between pedophiles and somebody who's not a pedophile because I've been molested. Here's the name. Go investigate. And let me push this forward. There are thousands of people in Hollywood who have this same information. Why is it all on me? Why is it if I don't release the names in the next two months, six months, or a year, I'm the bad guy. I'm the victim here. I'm the one who's been abused. I'm you know, think what you want about Corey Feldman, but that dude has been warning everybody for like over a decade that this stuff's happening. And it's sickening to hear the response from some of these reporters he's talking to. If this really happened, then why are you talking to me about it? Like he's accusing him of making it all up. When everyone knows this stuff goes on, he's just one of the first to come out and actually say something because he's not worried about ruining his reputation to get the truth out there. And I think Corey Feldman falls into that camp of... Uh, well, they say whatever age you become famous, you kind of stay that age mentally for the rest of your life. I think Corey Feldman absolutely falls into that. He's like a child as far as like his behavior and stuff. I've watched an episode of him on like MTV Cribs or something where he was showing his house and it was like a 14 or 15 year old was hosting this episode and walking you through his house. That's just his mentality. But I, And I don't say that to be negative toward him. I actually like Corey Feldman. Uh, I'm a fan of his work whenever he was younger doing these movies and stuff. Huge Lost Boys fan. But yeah, I think just because he's still kind of childlike in his mentality and 
not really super famous anymore. He's kind of looked at as a Looney Tune, and no one took him serious. Because of that, how much more horrible stuff went on that could have been avoided if everyone would just listen to him. In 1972, Rockefeller bought up, shut down, or bankrupt 90% of the oil companies. Our good old Constitution came into place, and in 1911, the Supreme Court found Rockefeller in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and split Standard Oil into 34 independent companies, so they said, you can't have the monopoly on this, you're done. You think that changed who he was? No. He promised to bankrupt America. At that very same time, they were learning how to turn petrochemicals, exactly what he had at his fingertips with the oil, into pharmaceuticals. Now John D. Rockefeller's biggest threat was natural health. So what does he do? Being the businessman he is, he donates money to the medical schools because he wants to control. And what do you do when you want to control someone? You give him money. And then he hired a guy by the name of Flexner to study the school's curriculum, to figure out what they were teaching everybody, and to persuade the government to establish allopathic medicine, which used the unnatural substances to treat diseases. This is how Western medicine was founded. So all of the medications that we take are petroleum-based pharmaceuticals. Sounds super healthy, don't it? <laughs> There was a cave found in the Grand Canyon in the early 1900s that predated Native Americans and in fact looked like it came from Egypt and the Smithsonian denies it to this day, yet they funded the expedition. So 1908, this explorer, he wanted to get go to the Grand Canyon to look for gold. So he was going down one of the rivers in the Grand Canyon and saw a mineral deposit about 2,000 feet up on a cliff. Went up there and he saw some bushes or whatever and he pushed the bushes aside and it was a staircase that led up to a he said clearly a man-made cave yeah he walked in there and immediately it was like what am i looking at because it looked like there was hieroglyphics all on the walls and so he did a little more exploring and it was huge and so he was like this is crazy and so he like took some pictures and stuff and then went to the smithsonian is like can you fund me and like we'll get a team out there to see what this is yeah so they went out there and it was basically an underground city and they, they said that oh at one point in time, it would have housed like 50,000 people. If you go there to this day, it's fenced off. There's just this one restricted section. The natives in that region, they talked about how they weren't the first people on the land and that there was people actually before them. And those people were taught by the star people. And like oh they're taught by the star people how to make nice. weapons, how to do nice. like this, this, this. The way that they describe this fenced off area kind of implies that it's a known location. Like people are aware of where this fenced off area is and you're just not able to go in there. It makes me wonder if we made a run on the place. <laughs> and got in there do we know the location of an underground city are we aware of where there's a location like that that would be fantastic to check out the more i hear about old america the more i'm convinced that there's a lot of history here that's just overlooked but i'm gonna stop right there that's the end of the videos but don't go anywhere <laughs> so i'm gonna do a mail call I actually got some some stuff sent to my P.O. box today, and I wanted to share it with everybody. First, I've got a book that I received, and it came and it came with a letter. I'm going to read the letter. Hopefully, the uh, individual who sent me this won't have a problem with that. Hey there, Barry. We discovered your channel a couple of months ago and are now avid watchers. We love your content, and although there seems to be a few that are trying to put out similar stuff, your presentation can't be matched. You're awesome. Thank you. My husband's grandfather was a channel. He passed away a few years back, but I will add a link to one of his appearances on BBC. This was a long time ago, but it's the only one I have of him in his prime. His name was Robert Short, and he was a well-known pastor of Blue Rose Ministries in the UFO world. So, says, my mother and father-in-law were able to get one of his books republished after he passed, and we thought you might like a copy. My husband is willing to answer any questions you may have, and I'm sure you'll have questions. Best wishes, Spring and Israel Browning. So this is the book that they sent me. And... They actually wrote a note on here that says, I wanted to add that my mother-in-law did write in our copies, but rest assured this copy was meant for you. And when you open the book, it actually says, To Israel, with so much love, love you, mom and dad. You gave me a book that was specifically for you, and not something that you just bought off of Amazon, but a book that was a gift to you, and you've passed it on to me. And I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. This is awesome. I cannot wait to dive into it. It's on the bookshelf. Next, I got a postcard from someone. I'm assuming that this person's username is MTB. This is Native American Symbols and Interpretations, American Hieroglyphs. 
very very cool thank you very much next this i do not have a name because the all right this came from colorado but i don't know who it's from because the label is actually cut off where the name should be so whoever sent me this thank you very much i appreciate it this is some new wall art <laughs> pretty awesome huh oh <laughs> i had it upside down <laughs> It's some new wall art. So that's going on the wall. Thank you very much, whoever sent me that. And the last package. This is from Jennifer Sloan with a note saying, enjoy your gift. I love your channel from Jennifer Sloan. Thank you, Jennifer. Let's see what you sent. It's in a small little box. Oh man, this is awesome. It's a small little UFO and a laser printer or laser printer, laser pointer. Check this out. It's a UFO fidget spinner. How freaking cool is that? That's perfect to replace my fidget spinner pyramid that I gave away. Perfect spot, fit right on the shelf. Thank you guys so much. This is amazing. This is so cool. I actually didn't even, I haven't even checked my PO box because I, I didn't expect anyone to send me anything. Got a message today that I needed to go check it because there was some stuff in there and man, you guys are awesome. Thank y'all so much. This is really, really great. Y'all made my day. <laughs> guys, I'm going to go ahead and call the video right there. Thank you all so much for, for the gifts and, um, and for watching the videos every day. This is really awesome. I really appreciate everybody so much. I uh, hope everybody has a great, safe, fantastic rest of your Friday, and I will see you tomorrow.